So I'm going to be talking about routing in the Lightning Network now. So I'm going to touch on how it's currently operating, some issues that you oh I've just clicked something over, <laughs> some issues that you run into when you are routing, and then some potential expansions to the spec which are going to address some of these issues. So we ran through the Lightning Network graph, the nodes of vertices, the channels in this graph are, are edges. And at the moment, nodes need to keep this graph in memory so that they can route quickly. If you store it in your database, it's going to slow you down very much. And that's sitting at about 40 megs, which is acceptable at the current state of the network, but we do expect this to grow. It's also required for routing. If you're a node in the Lightning Network, you need to be able to route. That's the reason you joined the Lightning Network. And you need to have this graph and all of the information it contains so that you can do that. We build the graph up with a set of messages, which are broadcast on the gossip protocol. So the first one that we use is something called channel announcements. So a channel announcement is telling the network that a channel exists. There is one per node in the channel. So a channel is between two parties at the moment, and we broadcast two channel announcements. And what you need to do with this is prove that you own one of the keys in the 2 of 2 multisig and the transaction that this channel is based on, and that you own one of the IDs of the nodes that this transaction claims to be, you know, these two nodes that have claimed to open a channel with these transactions. And furthermore, as I touched on earlier, these nodes need to agree on the announcement message. So both nodes need to sign both announcements. Uh, this is to make sure that no one broadcasts uh, channels that are supposed to be private. The next message that we use is something called a node announcement. This is a bit more sort of miscellaneous. It allows you to add further information to the channel announcements, which contain your node pub key. And we only take these into account um, according to the spec if these nodes already have a channel open. There's no point for, of you keeping track of a node if it doesn't have a channel open. It doesn't serve you at all. It has no purpose. And it's also a potential DOS vector, so we just discard these messages and do not forward them in the network. These messages also indicate nodes' willingness to accept inbound connections, so IPv4 or 6 or TOR addresses, um, which aren't really related to routing, but it does provide you with some additional information. And finally, these announcements have a strictly increasing timestamp. So if we see a timestamp with an old node announcement, a node announcement that we've already seen a, a newer timestamp for, and we see an older timestamp, we assume something is wrong and we disconnect from this node because they shouldn't be, they shouldn't be behaving like this. And finally, we look at channel updates. So with node announcements and channel announcements, we can build what the graph looks like. Channel, announce, channel updates allow us to change the values this graph has. So specifically, you can update your channel policy. This is the fees that you wish to receive for routing over this edge, which is a base fee per every single payment, and then a, P pay, a fee paid per Satoshi thereafter. And that's a, a bit of a difference from Bitcoin. People don't often realize when they start to look at Lightning is that your fee does scale with the size of your transaction, and meaning the Bitcoin size, not the kilobyte size. So that's a big difference. This also contains the time lock information that you, that you wish to accept over this channel and the limits that you place on HTLCs. The minimum amounts, the maximum amounts, and the total number of HTLCs you're willing to route through this channel. And these, again, are set per node in a channel. So a channel has direction. You can move funds back and forth between the two peers. And each node has the right to determine their own fees and their own time lock according to their risk preference. These messages can also be used to keep your node alive. So if you haven't done anything for two weeks, your channel will be pruned from the graph in most implementations. So you can send out one of these to keep alive. Um, However, these messages are currently flooded, and they make up a very large portion of network traffic, almost 40% last time I looked, which was about two months ago. And this is generally because nodes are flapping online and offline a lot. So every time they come back online, they send out a new channel update message to indicate what their current rates are. And this really clogs up the network a lot. Um, and it's a bit of an issue at the moment. So one of the first problems and one of the biggest problems we face in routing in the Lightning Network is that of unknown channel balances. So we advertise in that, node in that channel announcement the capacity but not the balance. So if I say I've got two Bitcoin in this channel, it might mean that all of it's on one side and I can route, I can route outwards but I can't receive anything on that channel. It might all be on the other side, meaning that I can, route, I can receive inwards but I cannot route outwards. Or it might be balanced, meaning there's Bitcoin on both sides, and I can route in either direction. 
And when you try and traverse an edge which doesn't have any Bitcoin in the direction that you're moving, you get a temporary channel failure on your payment. So this is when you calculate a route, it includes that, that channel edge, but it doesn't actually have any Bitcoin on the side that you're wishing to move across. And this means that your routing attempt will fail. So what a lot of the implementations do is they implement iterative routing. This means that you retry again, so you try and calculate a new route and either exclude that edge entirely from your graph temporarily, you don't ban them for having unbalanced channels, you just take them out of this specific iteration, or you can intelligently decrement the chances of using that channel in a routing algorithm. So both of those options. But the trade-off you have here is that you have to run the, routing, the path finding algorithm again, which I think for most of the implementations is Dijkstra. It's a pretty computationally expensive thing and leads to a really bad UX if you're sort of constantly waiting for this route to succeed. Uh, another option that was brought up on the mailing list recently is to rebalance channels um, in reaction to these failures. So if you are a node and you're routing a payment and it arrives and you actually do not have capacity, you can in that moment do what's called just-in-time routing, so to make a circular payment back to yourself to make sure that you actually have coins on that side. And while this, in theory, sounds like a really great idea, one of the problems is that you will incur fees making that circular payment back to yourself. You also need to have more than one channel. If that node only has, has one channel, you need to have a loop back to yourself to be able to rebalance. And the rebalance itself can fail, which further increases the amount of time that routing will take. Another channel we have is that, another problem we have is that people have out-of-date channel updates. Um, this means that you'll have an insufficient fee or time lock for a node. So if a node increases their fee and you have not, you've not received that message, then your, your payment is going to fail. However, these updates do take about 10 to 15 minutes to propagate through the whole network because we use this really basic flooding mechanism. So nodes are fairly tolerant of you being out of date. However, a lot of the issue comes in when you restart a node that hasn't been online for a long, t for a long time and you get completely bombarded with these channel updates. And generally, if you're a mobile app, which is the kind of node which is open once in a while, you don't want to open it up, have to wait for a whole bunch of things to download, and then make a payment. You want to open it up and pay. That's what you opened it up in the first place for. So there are a few solutions here as well. The first is to re-query for updates. So when you receive a policy failure, you'll know that you got the fee or the time lock wrong or the number of HTLCs. So you can query for that specific node's update and then get it. However, this still has the issue where you do have to recalculate the route. You still have to get that information and then retry and delay the user experience further. Another big win would be to have some gossip improvements. So the spec has agreed to move to inventory-based gossip, which will be much more efficient in terms of bandwidth. Um, I don't really see any big trade-offs right now. There's a very, very basic flooding mechanism in the network. So switching over to inventory would be a really positive thing. Another future problem for the Lightning Network is that of like client routing. So we could see that the memory requirement for the graph grows too big if we end up with a very large Lightning Network graph. We could face bandwidth constraints on very small nodes that don't want to sync up the whole graph or even parts of the graph. And we could struggle with route computation. So if the amount of computation required to iteratively route, which is a fairly likely situation given that we do not disclose channel balances, that may become a bit overwhelming for lighter clients. So some of the solutions and trade-offs that are here. Uh, the first one is to prune the graph, and I think this is pretty low-hanging fruit and there's a lot of space for optimization, especially with the current state of the network, which is a 40 megabyte graph. It is still pretty manageable as is. So you can do so by removing small channels or really bad channels with nodes that aren't online. You just prune them from your network view and you forget about them. Or you can use a more heuristics-based approach where you learn the expected neighborhoods where your node is likely to transact. So people do have spending habits. Maybe you buy a coffee every day. Maybe you wake up and draw a picture on Satoshi's place if that is your thing. Um, so you can train your node to, um, to, to figure out where you're going to be routing. Uh, the trade-offs here is that unexpected routes will fail. Pretty, pretty likely, if you are pruning the graph very aggressively, if you suddenly buy your Bitcoin beer at a different place, you're not going to know what that side of the network looks like and you're going to be in trouble. So another solution that people are starting to look at is the idea of offloading computation. 
So rather than light clients having to do all of this computation by themselves, they offload that to more um, resource intensive clients who do that computation on their behalf in exchange for fees. So one of the ideas out there at the moment is something called trampoline routing. And in this setup, you have a light node who stores a subset of the graph, including a set of trampoline nodes, which I've got up here with the three circles. Um, and then when they need to route, uh, well, the trampoline node has a much more extensive view of the graph. So I've used this big gray bubble to, to express the lightning network uh, because I don't have space on the slide. Um, and so you can offload computation to the trampoline node if you know of the existence of one or two. So if sender wants to, si to send to a recipient, you, route, you need to figure out a route from the sender to the trampoline. You then offload computation to the trampoline. You just tell them, OK, it needs to get to the recipient. And then the trampoline is responsible for the further pathfinding to the recipient. If this, if this routing fails, they then communicate that failure back to the trampoline. It doesn't go all the way back to the recipient. They don't have to deal with it. And the trampoline tries to route again. And if they are successful this time, so they do iteratively route and they succeed, then they send that success all the way back to the sending node who's made a transaction. And the way this... Oh. Sorry, quick question. Um, I noticed there was a node in between the sender and the trampoline. Is that for privacy issues? No, so we'll, we'll touch a lot on privacy about this. This is more that you're not necessarily going to have to... You don't want to just be opening up a channel with a trampoline. So you'll have a local view of the network. It's maybe got a few trampoline nodes and a few hops between yourself and those trampolines. Um, so that's kind of what that's trying to indicate, that you will do some routing yourself. It'll just be much less, because you're just trying to reach this trampoline, which will then do the vast majority of the routing. Yeah, but the trampoline doesn't know the sender necessarily. No, it doesn't know the sender necessarily. Um, OK, cool. So this is uh, one of the proposals out there for trampolines is PR. 654 on the vault specification. And the way this works is that you do a regular trampoline, a uh, regular onion to the trampoline, which is that first hop in the diagram. And this is the onion packet that looks like. So it's got type version, public key, and 1,300 bytes of hop, hop payloads. And then you put the trampoline onion inside of the hop payloads of the original onion in the last hop. And the trampoline onion packet looks very similar to the original onion packet. However, it's got a much shorter hop payload. So you get 400 bytes of payload. And these payloads are slightly different. So they have the amount, they have the node ID, they have the time lock delay, but they also have what's called recipient features. And these recipient features indicate what kind of recipient it is, so whether or not the recipient supports trampoline or not. And this is really important when we get down to routing to a recipient. All right, so what would multiple trampolines look like? If you have a graph set up here where sender A wants to send to sender Z, and they aim to achieve this with two trampolines, T1 and T2, on the image, A would first construct a regular onion, which is indicated by the white square, which tells B to route to T1. And then inside of that regular onion, they would put a trampoline onion which has these two further hops, right? So the, the next hop is T2, which is the other trampoline, and the next hop is the recipient node, which is Z. So A would send this, this um, onion to B, who has a look at this onion, peels off the first layer, and sends it to T1. Now T1 is a trampoline node, so it recognizes that there's a trampoline onion inside of the last hop of this onion. So they say, OK, my next destination is T2, and I need to route to it. So it now runs Dijkstra's algorithm or whatever pathfinding it has to build up a regular trampoline, I mean a regular onion. And that will have all of the steps that this packet needs to reach T2 in the network. <coughs> it then also takes the remainder of the trampoline onion and puts it back inside of this regular onion. So we created a new onion and now we're going to route it again. So this onion goes off on the lightning network and each node along the hop peels back the layer and routes it onwards until eventually it reads the second reaches the second trampoline. This trampoline, again, understands that there is a trampoline onion packet inside of the regular onion packet, whereas all the other nodes along the hop uh, between T1 and T2 didn't need to know that. They're only concerned with the next hop along the way. So they just look at the regular onion, they see where they need to go, and they send it on, no problems. But T2 gets this, um, this trampoline packet and has a look at the next hop in it, and it sees the next hop is Z. Z is also 
got the recipient features set so that it knows that Z is not a trampoline node, right? So it now needs to convert this final hop in the network into a regular onion hop rather than putting the, onion pa the trampoline packet back in the onion. So it now computes a route to Z, which is just a, sim a single hop from Y to route to Z, and then sends the packet on to Y, who sends the packet to Z, who receives the payment and observes absolutely no difference. And so a problem here is that there is a privacy leak if Z is not a trampoline <coughs> node because the second trampoline knows that they, are not, that they are the final destination because they had to convert it to a regular hop. If it was supporting trampoline, they would just put that trampoline onion back inside of the regular onion and Zed could, could unwrap it and would know what the message was and there wouldn't be any privacy leak. Okay, so on that note, moving on to some trade-offs. The first is this potential privacy leak. If all recipient nodes support trampoline, it would be fine, and there are some things that we can do to get around this issue, but if people aren't supporting trampoline, this is a privacy leak for the recipient. However, the degree to how bad this is, you can debate because we use source-based routing, so the sender already knows who the recipient is. There's just now one more party who knows who the recipient of this payment is, and that's the final trampoline. Another trade-off, oh, Yeah, yeah. So it just says, I understand this type of message. So I signal this feature. So it's an update. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it'll be a new feature, a new feature flag that you negotiate. Uh, another argument against trampoline routing, which I think is all right, is that if you use a trampoline, you're not going to learn about the network graph because when you fail, when you fail to make payments, you can discount certain edges and learn where you're routing well and routing badly. I don't personally rate this one very highly as a bad trade-off because if you are using a trampoline, you've already chosen to outsource routing. That's the trade-off you've made. If you do want you know, to learn more about the network graph and route more efficiently, then you, must, then you need to be able to support more of the graph. Fee estimation is really tricky with this. You can have a lot of trampolines, you can have a lot of hops between trampolines, and because you don't know what the network looks like, you have no idea how many hops there are between your trampoline and your destination. It might be one, it might be 15. And you're going to have to give fees for the 15 case, even if it's actually one. And this is bad for senders because it costs you. So you're going to have to have some maximum fee that you set. But it's good for incentivizing trampolines. It's good for encouraging people to run these great trampoline nodes where they can clean up on fees because they've got really efficient routing. Um, but nonetheless, it is tricky. And the final one, which is a bit of a nasty one, is the idea of a capacity attack. So much like you do if you want to probe balances in the network, um, you can lock up liquidity in the network by routing a payment through a very long path back to yourself and then just holding it there. At the moment, this is limited by the number of hops that you have in an onion packet, which is 20. So an attacker right now would have to open up channels to do this, but they can 20x their liquidity. So if I have one Bitcoin, I can lock up, lock up 20. Since trampoline allows you to create these multiple onions, if you have one Bitcoin, you can lock up 60. So it allows that attack to scale a lot more. And it's not entirely clear how we're going to address that at the moment. Um, it is an attack service which really hasn't been exploited at all in the Lightning Network, to my knowledge. But if we do move into sort of a competitive fee market where people are trying to outdo their competitors, locking up their liquidity with trampoline payments would be a good way to go. Another way of routing that the spec is currently looking at is something called rendezvous routing. This offloads um, computation in a different way by splitting the pathfinding burden between the sender and the recipient. And this also has great privacy improvements. This is what I would say one of the biggest motiva motivations for this proposal is, is that right now when A routes to E, A does know who the final node is. Whereas in rendezvous routing, Oh, also, if E is using a private channel, the way that you route to a node over a private channel is that they provide you an invoice with a hint. So if the last hop on this route is private, E will just provide a hint um, indicating that they should, they should route to D. Right? And this still does leak your general location in the network graph, which isn't great. So what rendezvous routing does is allow you to concatenate routes at a public rendezvous point. So say that C is advertising a rendezvous point. So this again would just be a feature that you set because you support this. 
the recipient node E would take a look at C and calculate a route from C to itself. And then it would put that route in an onion, so a regular routing packet. This onion would then go into an invoice, potentially, or just be communicated out of band and provided to the person creating that send. They will have the ability to see the first hop in this route, which is C. So A then just needs to compute a route to C, and then they can create an onion, which goes to that rendezvous point, into which the onion to the recipient goes. So then as we route, we start to unwrap the onion each point. So B gets the onion, and then it routes onto C, and C knows that it needs to switch ephemeral keys at this point, which is related to onion routing. So they can actually get the smaller, route, the smaller onion out of the bigger one, and then continue to route onto E. And some of the trade-offs here is that we lose a bit of spontaneity. So if you want to receive on the Lightning Network and you first need a calculated path to yourself, it means your invoices are pretty likely to have a bit more of a, li a lifetime or lifespan limit. So if you produce a route to yourself and then you send that invoice over three weeks later, then maybe that route doesn't exist anymore and the invoice is, is damned to fail because the channels don't exist. And another one, another big one, is the trade-off between privacy and cost. Right? So if you're sending to someone and you're using a rendezvous point, you don't know where they are. They could be right next to you. You could have one or two hops to get to them, but because both of you are routing to this arbitrary point, you might end up with 10 hops and end up paying a lot of fees. And that's kind of an inherent trade-off. You're not going to get around it. If you, don't know where, if you don't want people to know where you are, you're going to be difficult to find. However, you know, this is kind of the sender paying for the recipient's privacy, which isn't great, but you know, that's the way it is. Uh, yeah, thank you. Questions? Sorry, that's it. Oh uh, no, so if I have a channel open with someone and you're routing in this direction, only I, only I charge fees because it's my Bitcoin that's, that's being potentially locked up. Right? So it's my liquidity that's being used. And then if someone's routing to me, then they own the fees. Well, how, so at the moment, you can do um, 20 hops, and with trampoline, you can do 60. In terms of the timeout, it depends on the timeouts that the invoice has and the deltas across the route. So, like, so like, uh, I don't know the current defaults. I feel like you might be able I think it's a, some implementations have six, right? A delta of six as the default. Yeah. Yeah. Then on phone we put a lot more. It depends on the mm. I don't remember the default for Yeah. So I think I think there's a six block delta uh, default in lot limitations. So along twenty hops you're looking at hundred and twenty blocks. So two twenty hours? Yeah. I think that might be the default. But then also the person at the end of that route might have a minimum timeout, so it could be a lot more. And you can control that timeout at the end of the route, so, yeah. And you said that that hasn't been started? Uh, to my knowledge, um, but. Great, thank you.